Judges 6th chapter, 1st through the 8th verse. Does everybody have it? Amen. Amen. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. And I want to make a point that the last verse in chapter 5 says, Then there was peace in the land for 40 years. So there was peace before that. But when they disobeyed, they were turned, it o- they were turned over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made, hit, made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, the caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian, Amalek, and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemies hordes, excuse me, these enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels too numerous to count, and they stayed until the land was stripped bare. We all have people like that in our lives, even though we don't want to admit it. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. When they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the eighth verse says, the Lord sent a prophet to Israelite, to the Israelites. Father God, I just want to thank you for the reading of the word. I ask you, Father God, that you would just bless the word that's coming forth tonight. I submit and I surrender to you in every way, Father God. Have your way, Father God. Whatever that looks like, whatever that sounds like, God, have your way, Father God. I thank you for the atmosphere that's already been created here, and we thank you for your presence, Father God. Let your word hit its intended target, Father God, and don't let anybody walk out of here the same way they came in here, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I just want to take a moment because I never do, but I just want to take a moment to acknowledge my daughter who always comes to support me. Will you stand up, Brittany? And I also want to acknowledge she has some great friends who one is here tonight who also comes to acknowledge me. Brother Isaiah, would you please stand? You know, it's good to acknowledge people while they're alive. Because it does them no good for you to say wonderful things about them and they can't hear it. So thank you for your support. I appreciate that. I have a question. I'm going to open with another question tonight. Where were you when God called you to be something that you knew you were not? Amen. Remember, where were you when God called you to be something that you knew you were not? I want you to think about that. See, we all have had these moments when we have trouble believing God will do what he said he's going to do. Our enemies are accumulating, and we look at our current circumstances and ask why all this is happening to me if God is really with me. God is building our trust in him. And he expects us to give him a demonstration of what he's been building. When he tells us to flex, he wants a demonstration of the trust that he's been building within us for him that involves obedience. When you flex, 
It's an external demonstration of an internal working. In Judges 6, Israel had done evil in the Lord's sight once again. So the Lord handed them over to their enemies, the Midianites. The Israelites cried out once again to God, and God chose to use Gideon to deliver them. I'm not going to be before you long. I've got two points. But there are two points that if you allow it, it can change your life. One of the things that I like about Gideon, number one, Gideon was a judge. He was appointed a judge over Israel. But before he was appointed a judge, he was just like you and me. He was somebody that was busy. Because if you notice in the Bible, whenever God chooses somebody to serve him, it's always somebody that's doing something. It's not somebody that's just sitting, twiddling their thumbs, looking for something to do, waiting for somebody to ask them to do something. But it's always somebody who is busy doing a work. When God found Gideon, Gideon was hiding out because the Midianites had destroyed all the food, all the cattle, and he was hiding out in the cave with the rest of his people, separating grain. Because he knew if the Midianites found out that he was doing that, they would take that as well. So one of the things that God had to show Gideon, because he didn't have a mindset to do more than work. And sometimes, you know, God has to find us and show us that we are created to do more than just work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we're created to lead. We are created to serve. But some of us just want to work because... Let's face it, sometimes it's easier just to work. Because yeah. sometimes you don't have to think, you just do. You just wait to be told. But God created all of us to do more than just work. Yeah. One of the things that God showed Gideon, and this is my first point, one of the things that God showed Gideon, he wanted Gideon to know how God saw him. God showed Gideon that Gideon was who God saw he was. In verse 12, it said God first addresses Gideon as a mighty hero and tells him the Lord is with him. And the title of this message is when God tells you to flex. After God told Gideon that he was a mighty hero and that the Lord was with him, Gideon's response is, just like ours is many times, it was to deflect from what God told him about him. And what he did was he started acknowledging the circumstances that he found himself in because the circumstances that he was in did not line up with what God was saying who, that he was. Now, I don't know how many times that we have found ourselves in those same circumstances. I know for me, when God was telling me that I was a woman of integrity, he was telling me I was a woman of integrity when I was out, when I was out there bed hopping. He was telling me I'm a woman of integrity. He told me I was a woman of influence when I was in the casino, spending money that I didn't have, not paying my tithe. Can I be real like that? Yes, See, God will tell you something that you aren't because he sees it. And you say, I can't agree with that because of the circumstances that I, I don't look like somebody that's, and I'm not, I don't have behavior of somebody that has integrity. I didn't have behavior of somebody that had influence, but God said it anyway. And what I learned in Psalm 139 is he saw my unformed body before my, before I even came to be. And the days of my life were written down in the book. So that means to me that the assignment on my life was present before I even committed a sin. That's what you have to remember. Your promise was there before your sin was. <laughs> Gideon's response was to deflect from what God said about him and to acknowledge the circumstances that did not support what God said. 
what Gideon said was, in verse 12, why is this happening to us? Where are the miracles our ancestors told us about? See, the generation that knew God had died off. And so they had a new generation that came. And they only heard rumors about how good God was and all the things that God did. But they didn't know for themselves. And so in the circumstances that they found themselves in, what they heard didn't line up with what they experienced. Y'all ever been there? In up-to-date terms, this is what Gideon was saying. If I am a child of God, why, God, did you allow that to happen to me? I'm serving your people who don't appreciate what I'm trying to do. I tithe, but I still have needs. I work in game time with other people's kids, but my kids are raising hell. God, what? How can you tell me I'm this when all these things are going on in my life? It just doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't line up. We even go as far as to say, I don't look blessed, but God says that I am. And after, which God often does, after he said all of that, God's response was, in verse 14, go with the strength you have. He didn't even respond correctly to what Gideon said. He told him to go with the strength that you have. He said, I am sending you, which means that your circumstances don't determine your purpose for your life. When God is going with you, when he says, I'm sending you to do something, it doesn't matter what you face because you've already won. Even though it doesn't look like it, you've already won. The battle is not yours to fight. You're just supposed to participate. He didn't tell you to fight it. He said participate because it's already won. One of the things that God did was, and this is another point, God instructed Gideon to do something he had never done before. And how many times has God given us an assignment and it reminds me of Noah when he was building the ark. God gave him all these instructions. He told him to build the ark. He told him about the measurements. He told him how to, well, he didn't really tell him how to do it. He told him what it's supposed to look like. And he had nothing, no model to follow whatsoever. But yet he did it perfectly. When God specifically sends you out to do something, he empowers you to do it. You don't have to have something in front of you to show you how to do it. Yeah, yeah, that's good. You start doing it, and then he shows you. And I know for the world, that's kind of in reverse. But in God's kingdom, you start, and then I'll start. In chapter 7 of Judges, when it was time to assemble an army to fight the Midianites, there were 32,000 that enthusiastically volunteered to be a part of this army. 32,000. And how many know that if you present something right, if you say it in the right way, you can get people fired up for anything. If you use the right words, dangle the right bait, then you can get anybody excited about anything. And that's what happened here. 32,000 people volunteered to serve in this army. But God said, you know what? That's too many because if I allowed 32,000 people from Israel to go and fight the Midianites and they won, they would think it was them that won the battle. They would still not acknowledge me. So God instructed Gideon to tell the people or to offer if there is anybody among you who is afraid or timid and I want you to go home. 22,000 people were found to be afraid and timid and went home. 
22,000. See, you have to have more than enthusiasm to get things done. You can't just feel good. You got to have something to back that up. So we have 10,000 left. God says, that is still too many. So he instructed Gideon to tell the men, because where they were, they were out in the desert. It was hot. It was extremely hot. So he instructed them to tell the men to go down to the spring and get a drink. So those remaining 10,000 went, went down to the spring to get a drink, and he told them to notice. He told Gideon to notice the ones that bend down on their knees and lap up the water like a dog and notice the ones that cup water in their hand and bring it up to their mouth. Now, I thought as I was reading this, because I've always wondered, at the end of the day, God chose the 300 that drank from their hands to fight the battle. And I always wondered why he chose those 300 because you would think if somebody's just thirsty enough to get down on their knees and just go for it, that you could ask them to do anything and they would do it without a second thought. And see, the one thing about men is that we look for the obvious. Now, it would be obvious that somebody who would go that, go that route would be the ones that I want to fight for battle because I would just have to give the signal and they would go. But that wasn't the case. These 300 who cupped the water and drunk from their hand, they were the ones who could still look around. They could still look around for danger. They could still see who was coming. They were the ones that God chose. But see, the thing about it is, even though he chose them, you can flip that and say, these were the ones who were still kind of afraid. They were cautious, but they were still kind of afraid. But the fear didn't stop them from fighting. It just made them cautious. And so God chose to use people who were a little cautious, who knew that alone they didn't have the ability to do what he was getting ready to call them to do, but would do it anyway. And what I love about God is he doesn't always do the obvious. He'll choose the weakest person. He'll choose somebody that nobody would ever choose, that people will step over, that people will talk about, that people will cut up, that people who have disqualified themselves for where they came from, he will use them first because, you know, they can't go any lower than they already are. And you would think that somebody that had nothing to lose, you wouldn't be able to trust because they would just up and run. But God sees that another way. He said, you don't have anything to lose by following me and doing what I called you to do. Have you ever been there? And long story short, he took that 300 that God chose out of the 32,000, which is 0.9%. He took that 0.9% and he destroyed the Midianites. He won that battle. So it's not about numbers. There's a saying that goes, it's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. So when God is on your side, numbers don't matter. Numbers don't matter when God is on your side. They don't matter. The second point I want to make is this. God had to convince Gideon 
that God was who God, excuse me, God had to convince Gideon that God who, the God was who Gideon heard he was. See, it said back in verse 12 that we heard about the miracles and we've heard about all the things that you've done, but I have yet to see it. I'm hiding in the cave. I'm, I'm separating grain so I'll have something to eat. I may lose my life. So if you really are who you say you are, I need to see it. And what I love about God, he's never, you know, even after sending his son, the best and most expensive gift, he still keeps proving himself to us. He still keeps proving himself to us. When he doesn't have to prove not one more thing, he still keeps proving himself to us. In verse 17, Gideon asked for a sign that God was who he said he was. So God told Gideon to prepare a sacrifice in verse 20 of meat and bread. And he told Gideon to pour broth over it, which means that the meat and the bread would have been soaked. The Lord demonstrated his power by completely consuming with fire from a rock, not from a match, but from a rock, the entire sacrifice burned up like it was never there. God proved himself to Gideon with small victories to build his trust in God as he often does with us. When God tells us to flex, it means demonstrate his power, not yours. Come here, Mike, please. I need you to flex. <laughs> okay, you can see his strength. Now his strength will only take us so far. But when it comes to God's strength, God needs somebody who knows how to worship. God knows somebody who knows how to acknowledge him. Thank you, Mike. That's the kind of strength that God needs for us to demonstrate. We don't need to keep those things a secret. The muscles that he developed were done in the dark. What God does, he shows himself strong in the light so that everybody can know that it was him that delivered you. It was him that saved you. It was him that rescued you. It was him and nobody else. Nobody else. Nobody else. It's those small victories that build our trust in God. It's the small victories. I'm going to ask you one more time. Where were you when God called you to be something that you knew you were not? I want to encourage you tonight not to allow where you are right now to stop you from being what God called you to be and doing what God called you to do. Because where you are is a temporary place. It's a temporary place. One of the things I learned, I came home one day and I have two plants that are in my front yard right next to my house and they were both planted at the same time in the same soil, same seed, planted at the same time, given the same watering, given the same care. One plant grew up strong and flourished. The other plant struggling and weak. And for weeks I came home and I looked at that. And then I heard the Lord say, I said, what is, what, what's the difference? What is, determines when one grows and one does not? He said, the purpose of the seed is what determines the purpose of the seed. Because this plant that was watered 
just like this plant, responded because its purpose, it needed to be strong. This plant over here that received the same watering, that is the same seed in the same soil, because its purpose is different, its journey is different. Now, they'll both get to the same place, but this one needed a little bit more. This needed a little bit more exposure. This needed a little bit more heat in order to sustain. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? Don't despise where you are. It's temporary. It's temporary. God is so good. And take where you are as an opportunity to learn how to trust him. Take it as an opportunity to learn how to flex for God. We have flex for a lot of other things. Let God teach you how to flex for him. Let God teach you how to demonstrate his strength through you. And when you do that, don't keep it a secret. Don't let it be a secret. Be grateful for the small victories because they all count. You got to be grateful for that. Be grateful for the small victories. I'm going to take this opportunity. There is more I could say, but I'm going to be obedient. And I want you all to think about, seriously, seriously think about where you are right now. Think about the last thing that God called you. What is the last name that God called you? Because we can remember when other people talk crazy to us. But what was the last thing that God said to you? What was the last thing that he whispered in your ear? What is the last thing that he called you to do that you haven't done yet, that you're struggling with? Because you're looking at your circumstances. And your circumstances don't line up with what he's calling you right now. Change that. You got to agree with what God says about you, not your circumstances, not the mistakes you made, not the decisions, not the failures. You have to agree with what God said. If you want things to change for you, you have to agree with what God said about you. I don't care how many times you failed. You're still here. You still have the opportunity to be who God called you to be. Give God an opportunity to flex through you. Give him an opportunity.